Yes, I did fly from Geneva this morning, for sure. Yes, yes and I you did. flew Swiss? I flew Swiss, for sure. <laughs> well, do you have a choice, I guess is the better question. Between Geneva and Zurich? No, I don't no. have a choice. <laughs> Out Swiss. of Geneva, there are a few options, but I'd always privilege Swiss. Yes, I, I, I would assume that <laughs> you would like. Do you even like to fly? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. I've always liked to fly. I've never wanted to become a pilot or something like that, but I enjoy being in an aircraft. Okay. I really, really enjoy being in an aircraft. I enjoy the travel. And, and so obviously you've, you've made sort of, you know, you've kind of gone in the right direction. Yeah. In terms was, of ending up in an airline. Yeah. Not that you ever planned it, as I understand I haven't it. planned it. No, I'm, I'm, it, nothing like did, did kind of, it wasn't written that I would join an airline industry. I studied at the Ecole Hotelière de Lausanne. Mm -hmm. I've always had a passion for customer and service and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then I did spend 12 years at Nestle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in a moment in my life where I was really open for new opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I've been given the chance to try to turn around this, this difficult business in Geneva. Well, <laughs> so let's jump right in there. I mean, obviously, you're not a stranger to being in the hot seat in the sense that, you know, the, the fate of the Swiss Geneva hub mm -hmm. has been a hot topic in terms of profitability. Um, what is it like for you to be associated with this um, issue that does bring up always this connection to being a problem, to being difficult, to being a challenge. How does, uh, well, that, how does that make you feel? For me, it's, 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 a, it's a strong motivator. I, when I've been given the chance to join Swiss in Geneva and turn around, I was aware that I, was, I would be the problem kid in the family. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I take, I think for myself and the teams in Geneva, we take a certain pride in demonstrating that yes, we have been a problem, but we might become also part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, been, it's been a, I have to say, it's been a difficult way, but yeah. it was good. Oh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> you have a good attitude, <laughs> it seems. I enjoyed it. I mean, <laughs> you like challenges. Yes, I do. I think yeah. it's, and it's not just a posture. Mm -hmm. I, I'm this kind of character that I need kind of a challenge or even a little bit of a threat. Mm -hmm to put myself in a risky situation. And this is where I, I, I think I give uh, the best of what I can give. I'm not, I wouldn't see myself like being given a business and just manage it. Yeah. I, I, I preferred this thing like fix it. So at the time, you know, when they came to you and said, you know, yeah. 2013 yes. was about when yeah. you came on, things were not going well. Not at all. At the time. Not at all. <laughs> and you did, you, you were been credited with taking out of the nosedive yeah. that it was in, um, and you just said, bring it on. Yeah, well, I think the challenge for Swiss, especially in Geneva, mm -hmm. is the point-to-point short-haul traffic. This is where, as a legacy airline, as we tend to say, or a full-service airline, as I prefer to mention it, you battle... What is the difference? Well, I think it's maybe a bit of a wording thing. I, okay, I, I, okay. Full I, I tried, service. Yeah, I try to position it more as, as, a, as a service than a legacy. Okay, okay. Um, you're battling low costers, and they have another business model. It's not that they do a better or mm -hmm. a worse job than what we do. It's two business models competing one towards each other. And in Geneva, more than 50% of the market is dominated by low costers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we were there with our full cost structure, full service structure, maybe a little bit of a vision that was not the right one on how we should battle that. Mm -hmm. And this is how it all started with, with Geneva and then Geneva Reloaded a bit later on. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a fantastic journey. It's been a tough journey. That's Let's not said. hide the it. The turnaround wasn't overnight, no, though. No, it wasn't overnight. It took us five years. Five, even, five years of hard work. And even two years ago, they were still yeah. debating whether yeah. or not to continue in Geneva. Absolutely. And I think it's a debate that is um, relevant for, for a group like the Lufthansa Group that is spread Europe-wide that has a hub business for the long-haul traffic, but also an European point-to-point -point business, and you're battling these low-costers, and, and you, you try to figure out the best, the best solution, and there is a number of solutions competing within the Lufthansa Group. And it was um, our task, if I may say so, to demonstrate that, yes, there is one solution, but there is a few other options. And, and, and we've been given the chance also to go along that option. I mean, other companies would have said, guys, this is it. This is the solution for the group. 
We do not accept that somebody in a smaller uh, try something new and we've given the chance to, to innovate and, and, and demonstrate our purpose. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there is a little bit of entrepreneurial courage from the group mm -hmm. itself. And there is also recognition that Swiss in Geneva and Swiss in Switzerland still has its roots within the history of aviation in Switzerland mm -hmm. and Swiss Air. And Swiss Air in Western Switzerland has a bit of a complicated story yes. with, its local, with its local market and there is a high level of emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we claim with right, we are the airline of Switzerland connecting Switzerland to the world. Mm -hmm. We can't be the airline of Zurich. So it was important mm -hmm. to be in the second largest economical area of Switzerland, which is Western Switzerland, to still have the Swiss airline mm -hmm. Of the, or the airline of Switzerland being present there. I think entrepreneurial risk, innovation a little bit, testing, plus this mission we have connecting Switzerland made that we've been given two more years to, to turn it around. Okay, so you have kind of a deadline in a sense? Two yeah, the years? deadline is December 31st, 2018. Okay. Um, in our internal lingo, we call it the black zero. Mm. To, uh, mm -hmm. But it's, 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 we need to get to an acceptable level of profitability. Mm -hmm. And not so much on the short term be profitable at the end of the year. But the whole work we did over the past five years was not just about surviving. It was about building the right foundations for having Swiss further develop it out of Geneva mm -hmm. on the short haul in the, in the medium. That was, and so this profitability level we're looking at is the base for getting that. Uh, just to go back for a minute, it's interesting that they did have this entrepreneurial spirit because as I understand it, you know, Lufthansa is very much about the numbers. They see it, they just, they're looking at the bottom line, yet they've given you this space mm -hmm. to, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of break. So do you feel like they understand then the importance of the Swiss Air or the Swiss Airlines brand to the Swiss people? I mean, have they understood this? I think they did or we did as a group. I, I don't like they and we, it's <laughs> one company. Yeah. As I said, uh, I grew up professionally within Nestle, so I'm used to large corporations. Okay. Lufthansa Group is, is maybe needs to do some work there. But <laughs> um, we, we, I think we, we understood the role of Swiss mm. as an airline for Switzerland. But at the same time, I think we also identified that the Geneva market with its challenges around the domination of the low cost offer, would be an ideal prototyping or innovation platform to figure out what would be solutions that would work okay. wider in the Lufthansa group across our airlines uh, that, that are uh, operating in Europe. And I think the combination of the two and, and saying, okay, they look like they're poised well for success. Let, let the, give them a chance with a hard deadline and let's see how they can innovate and maybe we can profit from the innovation on the longer run. So what is the plan? How do you plan to beat the low costs, like EasyJet, for example, that you said, has more than 40% of the air traffic in Geneva? Um, I don't think we can beat them. Okay. I don't think it's about beating them. I think it's about compl completing a market offer. Um, I look at it a little bit like I look at a retailer shelf, okay. where you have private labels. Yeah. You have low cost and low price labels. Then you have a little bit of a general market label. Mm -hmm. And then you have some things that are premium. And there is space for everybody on the market. As long as you provide the right services and the right offer and the right pricing to your market. And this is probably one of the things we've worked most on it is saying Swiss is not a just an airline. We are Swiss International Airlines. We have our values. We offer you product and services and travel experience. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be compared to. I didn't write my strategy because them doing something, I do something. But we decided still to go around. competing with them somehow. Yeah, you, you're still competing. But we want to provide an alternative to the low-cost offering in the Geneva market. Okay, which is so, what? Well, which is another product. It's another experience. Um, I sometimes say jokingly, we enable people, we allow people to travel. Low cost to just transport you from point A to B. 
<laughs> and I think this travel thing is, is about creating uh, the right experience. Yeah, so you have, okay, so I see this. So you have to really focus on the experience because otherwise, I mean, consumers tend to be very price sensitive. Yes. I mean, myself included. Well, I think the price sensitivity is a reality. Mm -hmm. However, if we are able to provide you the right services and the right products that have a value to you, mm -hmm. you will be willing to pay a little bit for it. The challenge, and that was all what Geneva Reloaded was about, or part of Geneva Reloaded mm -hmm. is still about, is identify what are the product and services passengers require, need, and value, mm -hmm. and what is the price tag we can put behind. And then you can move on. And this is my perception of premium. Premium doesn't mean luxury. Premium doesn't mean free. Premium for us means we give you the choice to shape your experience to your, to your needs. The first pillar is we had to work on our, let's call it production tool. So the aircrafts. And we invested into the Bombardier C-Series, mm -hmm. which is a modern design, clean sheet design aircraft. It's the next generation of short haul aircrafts. It's easier to operate, it's cheaper to maintain, it burns less fuel, okay. it makes less noise, and it's designed for short haul in Europe by the inner experience for the customers. So first of all, was that changing the fleet, going away from the Avros and the 320s to a new and modern effective and efficient production tool, okay. first thing. Second thing was the offer. We cannot claim connecting Geneva to Europe with a network of destinations that doesn't fit the market needs. So we worked on our network of destinations, the places we fly to, and how many times we fly to those places, mm. which is our network. So we, now those 36 destinations, which are a mix of heavy traffic destinations, leisure destinations, and some niche and competitive destinations where we want to fly wing to wing with our competitors. Mm -hmm. Second pillar. And third pillar was this value, uh, these added value offerings where we did put a lot of, of work in identifying what does matter to passengers. Mm -hmm. How can we remove pain points? Some of the pain points we have to remove and some of the pain points have value to the passengers and maybe we can commercialize them. Mm -hmm. So the combination of an effective production unit, if I may say so, with a good output, which is the good destinations and the good network, and added value offerings in a number of topics, like uh, how do you get to the airport? How fast can we get you through security control? And all those matters, combine the whole thing, better cost base and income, uh, improved incomes. Normally, if the income is good, and the, the total is, is positive. What about HR? Well, just, just because, you know, people in the airline industry are not known for being the best paid employees. Well, well, How do you manage that? The salary is, is probably only one dimension of, let's say, the compensation package for our flight attendants. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, they start their career with a, a relatively uh, low salary, that's true compared to other salaries. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that our requests to them in terms of personal qualifications are not super, super high. Okay. So for, but then don't forget, they no have- No Ausbildung involved? Excuse me? <laughs> no Ausbildung <laughs> not, not that much. We, yeah. we, we, we train them on Just the job. Traditional training, we, we, yeah. We, we, we really bring them up to speed on in our, the way we want them to work. Mm -hmm. So there's the salary, then there is they have commissions for sales on board, which make a difference rapidly. And then they have all these compensation or, or other travel benefits. You know, they can fly to the Maldives for less than 100 Swiss francs. Okay. So this makes them- There's inherent, you yeah, know, there's some inherent incentives. So pluses. I think, yeah. That's how you manage that. Yeah, and so I, it's not about cutting back costs in terms no, of we, labor. No, no, if you look at, at Geneva Reloaded as such, mm. in, in fact, we did invest a lot in turning the business around. In 2013, we made the decision to create a cabin crew base in Geneva. So we hired 160 flight attendants on local... So, so not, let's not cut the cost. Let's, I said we need to invest in into HR. the quality because... Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely of the, of the conviction that 
the quality perception of our passengers, having this travel experience and not just this transport experience mm -hmm. makes a difference on the long run. So the million dollar question then is, what will happen with the Geneva Hub? Well, uh, what will happen? I have now to say that I'm in a very privileged position. Um, we've been working hard during five years to create the base for the next step. And we're currently working on what is Geneva, Swiss in Geneva in 2022, 2023. Let's say again, a five year span. And I was just thinking of it because, I mean, almost every country in the world, somebody has to travel to Geneva yep. <laughs> because it's such an international yep. um, space. Yes. So it's, anyway. So oh, that's also part of the equation of, of who needs to travel and why mm -hmm. you travel to Geneva is for Swiss to continue to be successful in Geneva, we need to further establish ourselves in Geneva. And this in our world means adding a certain number of aircrafts based in Geneva. Okay, so Currently, there is eight aircrafts based in Geneva for the short-haul business mm -hmm. and one for the long-haul business. So we're currently... Are you going to grow in the long-haul business out of Geneva? We're currently working on a number of, of business cases where long-haul is also a part of the options. But this is... we go to New York. We go to New York yeah. daily, yes. Okay. Yes. Which destinations, which routes, long-haul, medium-haul, short-haul, mm -hmm. is all in the calculation, is all in the doing. And I have to say, I don't want to tell too much about it because there is some competitive insight about it, which uh -huh. I don't want to share with too many other airlines that might come on the same idea than what we do. Okay, about the long hauling. About <laughs> the size of Geneva, the size okay. of Swiss in Geneva. But it's for okay. sure we, I but, call but it- But the reality is if it doesn't work out by the end of the year, it's well, but, over. Yeah, but my reality or, is, it will work out. <laughs> I now, like this. You choose your reality. Oh. No, but, but literally, if I, I have this split thing in, in myself. I'm a very fact-driven mm -hmm. business guy, number stock. Mm -hmm. But I also have this emotional thing that is important to the me. The Italian. This is the Italian, Italian Maybe the, Ita <laughs> the Swiss Italian roots from, from my mother. But yeah. um, numbers tell me that unless there is a massive market change, which is beyond our control, mm -hmm. we will be successful. If my business here would have closed June 30, I would have achieved my targets. Okay. So it will take a lot not to achieve them. What is, I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear you talk because you are, like you said, a cultural mix. You are Swiss but you have this Italian, you have German, you were raised in the French-speaking part. You almost embody, you know, I, <laughs> the <yeah>. Switzerland. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you fly all of the different flags. Um, what for you is, speaking from the position of leadership, what is a good leader for you? What is it, what is it that makes you successful as a leader? That's, that's, a, that's a challenging question because I think every, it also depends a little bit what you need to lead. What, what is the environment you're in. Mm. But I think for me, what, what I try to, to nurture in my leadership is commitment. Um, I, I'm fully committed to what I do and I need to believe in what I do. And then I have this ability to transmit, to transfer this commitment and this belief mm -hmm. into the teams. I think you also need to be very, very modest as a leader. Be very aware of what you know and especially of what you don't know. Mm. And have the courage to um, get the people around you that are specialists in mm -hmm. specific domains. Mm -hmm. And your job as a leader is to put that all into a harmonic, har harmonious, harmonious, harmonious yeah. picture. Make the, the orchestra play well. And, and transparency? Then, does Transparency, kind of, yes, I think it's... Because think, you've, you've spoken openly about what you call failures, things yeah. where, it, where things haven't yeah. gone well for yeah. you at Nestle in particular. Yeah. Um, and that's important to be able to share that and yeah. learn from that. I, um, I think you learn more from your failures and sharing them with your teams and trying to understand what happened mm -hmm. so that you don't repeat it again mm -hmm. than just being a, um, I know, no, um, I... I always get up in, a, for me, a good day 
is when I get, get up in the morning and you have an espresso. I know less than <laughs> what I will know when I get back to bed in the evening. That is a good day. That is a good day. Learning, always learning and share and, mm -hmm. and, and, and be aware of, of, of. And also, I think, giving a purpose to the people. Okay. Uh, sometimes some Are you a of, tough boss? Yes. Well, but I am tough in the sense of, I think I'm an easy boss to work with because I'm very clear on my demands. There is no, there's not much space for... Interpretation. Black, yeah. white, <laughs> yeah. blue. Now, Lorenzo wants, this is where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm very demanding. But I'm also, I think, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, I always praise my teams when we do a good job. Um, we succeed and I fail. I think that's also something that it's important. Right? And I give space to the teams to, mm -hmm. to test, to... To, 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 to innovate, to, and uh, mm. if it works, very well. If it doesn't work, I'll, I'll, stay, I'll, I'll stand for the team. Along those lines, I, I recently did an interview with the CEO of Hyperloop, these guys that are doing the, tra the pod transportation. Yeah. And so if you could, you know, dream for a moment, what, what could the future of transportation look like for you? Well, I think the future of transportation in mobility general, in mobility, general. mobility mm will be connected. It must be a connected, interconnected between the different mobility modules mm -hmm. thing. Uh, it will, there will be a, a, a dimension of autonomy, autonomous mobility. Um, so auto-driving cars or auto-driving... Uh, auto-flying planes might be a little... Well, auto-flying planes might be a little bit, but the well, technology but, will be well, available one day. I mean, uh, it's, it's all, the all, pilots all, jump in yeah, well, at or, the takeoff or, and landing. Yeah, or, or look at, uh, at uh, drones. You know, yeah. If the drone technology allows you to fly your little drone above your garden to see your new whatever you did mm -hmm. in your garden, why shouldn't be able to fly an aircraft over the ocean? Yes, it's being tested. Uh, yeah. You told me dream. Mm -hmm. I think it's yes, more yes, about, you're right. Dream, um, dream. But I think it's will, it also will be a lot about interconnectivity and intermodality of transports. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and maybe also, I'm not sure there's a race for speed we're trying to achieve, like Hyperloop, or, mm -hmm. or uh, there's, there's people working on supersonic aircrafts again, again. boom, yeah. and, and Boeing is, is working on something. And I'm not sure this is the answer, okay. speed. I'm, I'm, maybe the answer is, better, better organized. And another answer is, do we still need to move along as much as we do in our working lives, for example? Mm -hmm. If you look at the traffic jams between Geneva and Lausanne, it's all commuters. Mm -hmm. But technically, you and I could have had this conversation, you sitting here and me sitting in my office in Geneva. Yes, but it brings up the face-to-face. -face. Well, yeah, but, but, the lack you know, of connection if you're not. I, I agree, mm -hmm. but... Do we always need to go to the office for work? Will home office and, and home production with, you know, 3D printers? Do you printers? let your employees home office? Yes, yes. I encourage home office. Okay. I do encourage. I do it myself as well. Mm -hmm. Half a week, half a, half a day a week, usually I, I work from home. And it's, it's funny to see that, at least in my position, it's the most productive hours I have. Really? Yeah. See, home office is, yeah, depends, depends on who you've got at home mm, Exactly. when you're doing your home office. Well, I'm, I'm lucky. I married an entrepreneur. My wife is, uh, has created her own company, okay. and um, we made the choice uh, of not having kids. So home is, very, is a very quiet place. Oh, well, you, have your, you both seem to have your own kids in the sense that exactly. <laughs> she has her business, mm. yeah, she you does. have your business. Yeah. And we are wrapping this up. Before we do, I have to do my question out of a hat. Question out of a hat. Yes, which is a surprise. <laughs> There's a, there's a number Lots of Lots of questions out of a hat. There's a number. <laughs> Just one. Is I, thought, I thought you wanted to wrap up the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> this is for part two. <laughs> Do you have any irrational fears? Well, not of flying. Uh, not of flying, <laughs> for sure not. Um, I don't think so. I'm not a very... Um, I don't suffer a lot of fear. Um, Maybe, maybe that's my biggest fear, is suffering of fear. Maybe. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm often quite convinced about what I do. I don't, 
No, I don't have much fears. Well, that's good. Thank you so much, Lorenzo, for spending time with us today. Thank you.